Burning Sins, Chapter 1, Interloper San Francisco, North America, 2010 This is it. Three years. Three goddamn years have passed since Nathan Schmidt left his home, his new family, and everything that was good to him behind. In an act of selfishness, a way to escape the dread that consumed his life from the moment he was born, he took the easy way out and ran. Though in that time, he didn't simply run away from his problems, he knew they would follow him. If he left things as they were, not only would the very same gang that kidnapped his sister chase him down, but they would continue to pester and abuse the devil's enforcers, now that they were in their lowest state with the dawn falling into an emotional disaster. The whole thing was screwed, and when Nathan saw his sister in that chair, the back of her head smashed in. He knew he wasn't just going to run away. The game of vengeance was played for almost half a decade. The various expanded bases and operations of the vicious gang called the Pathogens being his target all across England, and soon, the United States. Months had rolled by before one of them was toppled, then another days after. One by one they all fell, member by member, base by base. His anger drove him to do the impossible. His grief always pushed him forward. It was his fault after all. His actions and inaction rendered the family he was employed into a vulnerable mess. He came into this profession and he was nothing but a curse to them. Several business ventures were turned into a shootout because of him. The Don's wife was murdered. His sister kidnapped and slaughtered. He should have known things would have turned out this way. He should have known bad things happen in bad business. They would have been better off on the street. But it's too late to take any of that back now. Maya is dead and Nathan wants revenge. He's let that genocidal vengeance build inside of him. That desire to kill. That desire to destroy. Three years of it festering in his heart had taken him over and devoured everything he felt was good in him. It has long since taken him over. But now that he's here, at the last stretch of his vengeful journey, that meaning has changed. How many more lives were destroyed in shootings and firefights with the pathogens? How many other children lost mother figures or siblings because Nathan got careless and couldn't give a damn about collateral? He knew he was taking it too far. But it's too late to back out now. He had set his final trap. By robbing a bank that was being strong-armed by the pathogens for longer than Nathan's been alive, he's attracted their attention. The loot now sits below him tethered, and wrapped in the middle of an abandoned warehouse. With makeshift explosives, Molotov cocktails tied to ropes above the floor, and the floor itself lathered in gasoline, Nathan had armed himself, readying one of the many rifles he had taken off of the corpses of the gang members. Kneeling down behind the thick boards covering the sides of the catwalk he posted himself on, he watched as the doors to the warehouse opened, several members walking in with guns raised and alert. Keeping himself hidden and quiet as they moved along the bottom floor, Nathan waited to see how many there were before making his move. Seeing at least a dozen present, he knew there were going to be more waiting outside. Lighting a match on his boot, he held it over the edge, taking bated breaths as they approached the gift wrap pile of earnings. When they all surrounded or got close to it, he let it drop. The second the fire went up, pandemonium swept through the last bastion of the gang's offensive force. Engulfed by the flames, the ones that had been at the thickest of the gasoline went up instantly, dying with their screams as they collapsed in flailing heaps. Raising his rifle, Nathan aimed for the doors and windows, seeing many more were indeed outside. Firing his weapon, he killed one off, startling the rest before another dropped. Now alarmed and aware of his presence, Nathan made his way down the catwalk and stuck the barrel of his rifle through another hole in the boards, taking aim and laying down two others just as they were getting confident. At this point, the team outside were making their way in, heading through entrances that were safer than the ones spewing the deadly flames. As one stepped through, his foot snatched a wire, and a Molotov dropped on top of him, rendering him the same searing, screaming morsel his friends were roasted into. Reloading more cartridges into the rifle, Nathan struck down three more pathogens before the fire inside began to die away. Some of the men on the other side of the building got the water pump nearby to start working again, 
and punctured a big enough hole for the unused water to spill into the warehouse floor. Grimacing at his luck, Nathan placed the rifle down and rushed off to the west platform, going into the office side just as some of the gang members saw him. Hey, there! He went in there! The doors and windows are barricaded! Some of them are even rigged! One of the members stepped forward, dressed differently than the rest. Puffing out a cloud of smoke from the cigarette he had in his lips, he huffed to the setup in front of him. Gotta admit, he's as clever as ever, luring us to the gold and lighting the place ablaze. He took the cigarette out, flicking it into the water. Find him. Get in there by any means and snuff him out. The boss will be happy to hear we finally ended Cerberus. Ah oh, yes, Cerberus. Nathan knew that name well. It was his nickname. His calling card, if you will. In Greek lore, that dog was a monstrous beast that oversaw the underworld. Though he was nominally a hellhound, Cerberus was not evil. Another working dog, just like him. Kind of poetic for a gang to give him such a name. Nevertheless, this hellhound is finishing his work, and this cute little merry band of thugs isn't going to stop him. Taking up another post inside the center office in the complex floor, he waited to hear the sound of one of the doors or windows being broken in. Nathan was almost about to put an ear to the floor, but jerked back up as one of them was shattered to his far left, an explosion following suit, and taking out another four members. A series of curses followed as Nathan crouched to the side of the office near the explosion, drawing his pistol, and firing upon the men that came in after the explosion's aftermath settled. The first of them died instantly, while two more choked on their own fluids when the bullets pierced their necks. The elite standing behind them ducked in cover. Damn it, kill him! He's in the center office! Nathan ducked back down and ran to the side. Hiding behind a post that was reinforced with rebar, the bullets didn't pass through it. One of the members attempted a rush to another spot for cover, only to be killed the second he settled himself in it by another Molotov hanging above him. Get in there, you lazy fucks! Overwhelm and swarm him! Boss, there's traps and fucking bottles everywhere! The whole floor's a kill zone! Then find a way around it! Kill that fucking kid and bring me his flayed face! Nathan could hear another window on the other side of the floor being broken into. The explosive set off just as the glass cut into the tripwire. Firing off in that direction, he managed to hit someone in the shoulder before he repositioned himself. That same man opened fire on Nathan, forcing him to crawl along the floor to avoid the hail of bullets that sailed towards him. Getting back to a sturdy cover, he snagged a small bag from a nearby desk, taking out another makeshift explosive and pulling its string. Tossing it out into the open, he covered his eyes as the tin can exploded, and a thick white powder blinded the pathogens coming in from that way. Putting on a pair of goggles... Nathan killed off the injured man along with his companion before refocusing on the main entrance to the room. Seeing a small group of what was left coming in, he shimmied over to a barrel of water, tipping it over and sending a small wave towards them. Plugging in the landline phone, he cut the wire attached to the phone itself and tossed it into the water, electrocuting the remaining men save for the elite. Watching his men get fried, he stumbled away, gulping down a lump in his throat before tossing his gun away. <sighs> Fuck this! Nathan could hear him taking off away from the door. Tucking the wire from the water, he waited for the last bit of voltage to discharge before running after the elite. Coming back out on the catwalk, he could see him reaching the stairs and making his way down. Taking one of the submachine guns off of a dead pathogen, he aimed at the stairs and let loose, a flurry of lead peppering the only way down to the bottom floor. The elite was only so lucky to be hit with just one of the bullets. It penetrated his knee on contact shattering his kneecap and causing him to double over and fall down the stairs. Groaning and yelling at the pain in his leg and the bruises he got, Nathan strode after him, walking across the catwalk and heading down the steps. The elite looked up at him as he stormed towards him, taking aim for his face. Wait, wait, wait! You want Packy, right? That's who you're looking for? Nathan rose an eyebrow, lowering his pistol slightly at the name. Packy? Who are you talking about? Pa Packy, his real name is Paxton Mahler. He's the last founder of the gang, the last leader we got. It's him you want, right? I can tell you where he is if you let me go. Nathan stared at the cowardly elite before aiming at his head again. Talk. There's a mansion in Pacific Heights. It was owned by a high-end family. We took it over. You can find him there, along with the best of us guarding him. My guess is you won't even get within a mile of him before- 
The elite's head fell back as Nathan fired a bullet into his eye, killing him instantly. Lowering his pistol, the hooded Cerberus glanced up at the exit, seeing the sun that was about to set. If the leader really was at that mansion, he wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. A perfect time for a house invasion. That's usually how it ends, right? They plead for their life with information, and the next thing you know, they just die. <laughs> Anywho, let's get on to our alive donators. Top donators, Jesse Smith, Star630, Battle Swaffle, Only One Thing, Sura, Ryan, and Calidus. Matchback, Jock, Lucio, Darkseid, Raiden, Norma, Spuck, Minar, Pastel, Skaz, Austin, Roland, Sorber, Thermal, Dredon, Mikolai, Rib, Runescythe, Will, Chris, Twinkie, Rysel, Shadow Moon, Luigi, Chancer, Crest, Big Smoke, Bobcat, Murder Princess, Jet, Little Mighty, and many more awesome people. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and live life to the fullest.